Hello, 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 welcome. All right, here we are again. We are continuing our series on love. So let's pray. One, two, three, pray. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you bless every single person that's listening to this word. Those who are listening live, but those who are also watching it, God, on the replay. I pray, God, that you touch them, independent, God, of where they are. Father, touch whatever needs touching. Move whatever needs moving. Magnify the situation, God. Show them what happens when their Heavenly Father comes into the situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome. We are going on this topic of love. And today we are starting off on fake love. Do you, let's, let's take a look, right? Oh, always go on the wrong side with these things. Um, so we're covering fake love. Now, many of you have, have been familiar of, with the topic of love, right? Um, people say love all the time, but as we've been going through this series, we've been kind of deconstructing what, what is love and, and how does it work. And what we're going to focus the most on this time is fake love, right? This is where it is not the real stuff. This is the key to understanding fake love. When you look at fake love, you have to look at the center. What is at the center? Because what you're going to see is this. If at the center is self, that self-centeredness is what makes it fake. If it was real, it wouldn't have you at the center. You see, love is always going forward, right? But here's what I, I want to do is let's see if we can anchor ourselves on a scripture they're literally one of the most famous scriptures in all of the Bible. This is a scripture that is quoted probably more than anything else. It's on bumper stickers, it's on t-shirts. But we're going to see if we can get from it today something you might not have seen, heard, or thought about on it before. And we're going to John 3.16. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. John 316. Say amen if you got it. John 316. Ready? All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read the word for your hearing here. It says, for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. All right. So the, 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 the King James version of it is probably the most famous. Right. For God so loved the world that he gave his um, <laughs> his beloved son that whomever believe in him shall not perish. Right. What I need you to catch here is this. God, who we covered in the past sermons. Right. That agape word. First Corinthians 12. Right. And then we look at first John. We, we were going through all of that. Go back and watch the older videos. We covered that God is agape love. All of the attributes you see in 1 Corinthians 12, or 1 Corinthians 13, sorry, you will see that that matches who God is when he says, I am agape love, right? Now, God is love, and so what does he do as a reflection of that? God gave. Because here is what you need to understand, is that love always are other focused. Love, real love, is always, always, always going to focus real love on others. You will never find in the center of real love self. That's why God gave, not take, gave. So I'm going to give you an easy example, right? And the first one I'm going to talk about is um, one of the God's great gifts to humanity is dogs. And the reason I say that is this. Dogs, dogs actually teach us, dogs teach us how to be devoted, how to love and be selfless in how it functions. 
I remember that I had a dog. It was a Rockwaller German Shepherd mix. The dog was like this big. He was just a beast of a dog. Love this dog, right? I would leave the house to go to college, and I would go to college, and I would come back, um, and my, my stepmom told me that the dog would wake up before he could hear me coming down the road. He would wake up because he knew what time I came home each day. And then when the dog would wake up, he would actually run up to the door in anticipation that he will soon hear my car coming down the road. And he just stood there and just was in position. And he just looked. And he was just waiting. And then once he heard the noise of my car coming down the road, he actually started to move around. And he got excited. And then he would just be just jumping up and down. And my mom would know that I was close because she would see the dog who was devoted to me so much that it gave up its own routine to match mine. It actually made his sleeping pattern match the time that I would come home. And then when I would open up the front door, the dog, because the way the house was structured was when you open up the front door, the screen door to the porch where the dog was would be visible. And so when I open up the front door, I would see the dog and he would see me. And I used to mess with him, man. I used to just love messing with him. And I would act like I don't see him, right? And I would just start walking by. And the dog would just take one paw and he'll hit the glass and look at me. And I would just look around like I didn't see him. And he would just start going crazy. He would start banging on the glass like, hey, come here, come here. And I would go out there and he would just love on me, right? What I'm saying to you is love is always other focused. When love becomes self focused, where you are at the center, it will always be fake love, never the authentic stuff, never real. But we need a refresher on what loves are, right? So, what I want to remind you of is this when we talk about love, right? We tend to think of it two times, too often, very generally. We think of it like, okay, I love pizza. I love, if you're from Jamaica, like I am, I love mangoes. If you're from the Philippines, they got good mangoes too, right? But what I'm saying to you is we tend to use the same word that for loving food as we say for loving our mom, our dad, our friends, and for God. But in the Bible, when you read in the New Testament specifically, you see that the word love has multiple meanings and has multiple expectations on you depending on what type of love it is, right? So in the previous sermons, we covered and we started off with agape love, right? And so with agape love, that's that love that you see in 1 Corinthians 13. But there's also this other love called storge love, which is for the family, right? Then you have the love, which is filio, it's for the friends. And then, of course, you got that erotic sexual love that is aerials, right? Where you get the word erotica from, right? So these are the four aspects of love. So when we talk about fake love today, we're going to walk through all four and how it impacts your life. The reason we share these messages is we're not sharing this just so your ears can be tickled and your heart can feel warm. We're sharing it to improve your life on earth and give you right relationship with God in heaven, right? We need this to become parts of how you understand and how you relate to God. And love is one of the biggest things for God because he is love. If you don't understand love, you don't understand God. So let's walk this thing through here and let's see if this is going to make sense for you. All right. Now, one of the things I need you to understand is that not everyone is going to see you and value you correctly. Right. And so what that means is this. Not everybody. Go to the next slide. OK. Um, not everyone will see you and value you. Right. So what I need you to get is this. I need you to understand that since everyone is not going to be able to see who you really are, 
you're going to need to change your expectations and how you respond. Because here's what can easily happen. You might see yourself as something and the people you love can't see that in you. You might value yourself a certain way, right? And the people on your job might not value you the same way. See, value is not about your actual worth. Value is about what does somebody else consider a valuable price to pay, right? Is this, is this, are you, is this car worth this much, right? Let's say, for example, I have a wedding ring on my hand, right? And the dollar value of this wedding ring is based on an actual market value. If you went to the store, if you went to a pawn shop, if you try to sell this, they're going to try to sell this to you for the, the, the market value of it, right? What other people consider fair. But this ring represents my marriage to my wife, right? And so this ring is a symbol of the commitment we have for each other. There is more intrinsic value on this ring than the market can actually bear. What the market will pay for this ring is not what I would pay for it if I lost it. I don't want a, a, an equivalent of it. I want this exact one, the one that we exchanged vows on that day because on that day it had that kind of value. What's your value? Let me tell you this in case you missed it, right? You can tell the value of something based on what price you'll pay for it. So Jesus says, you know what? Um, I'll give my life for you. So what's your value? The life of the creator of the universe. So never walk around wondering if you're valuable and never try to convince somebody of your value because Jesus Christ has already said that you are worth his life. Other people might not be willing to die for you or sacrifice for you or give to you, and that's on them. They might not be able to see the worth that God sees in you, why he was willing to die for you. That's on them. But I want you to know how to react and how to evaluate the relationships in your life right now. Right? So let's do this journey together. Let's start and see if we can walk through. The very first one we're going to look at here, right? Remember, fake love is always going to be self-centered. Fake love at its core will always be centered around you. So my first question for you, right, is going to be this. How do you, I always get the wrong hand, <laughs> how does your family treat you? Think about this, right? I want you to actually take a moment right now and think about this. How does your family treat you? If you have the courage to share, put a comment in there. How does, they, how does your family treat you? Do they treat you in a way where you feel like they see who you really are? Do, do you feel like they treat you in a way where they value you for who you really are or do they only treat you based on what they can get from you? Is your family members being selfish in their relationship with you? They're always asking you to do things without ever paying attention to the sacrifices that it takes. Let's, let's evaluate their words. How, what type of words do your family use to express love to you? It could be a parent. Let's start there, right? Does your parents, mom or dad, right, grandma, whoever is raising you, do they speak to you words that says, I love you? Do they speak to you words that says, I value who you are? And, or are they always telling you things based on what is going to benefit them? If they are not willing to sacrifice for you, right, then the love they're giving you is not real. The love they're giving you is fake. And the Bible is very clear about what family love 
should look like. The, the Bible says that you cannot neglect the needs of your family. You are worse than an infidel, the Bible says, if you will neglect your family when they're in need. You don't have to like them, right? The Bible talks about honoring your mom and your dad, right? It didn't say you have to agree with them. didn't say you guys have to be friends. But it does say that if they're in need, you are obligated by God to take care of their need. You cannot say you're family and I don't care what happens to you. Because love is always other focused. But how do they treat you? Are they sacrificing for you? Are they trying to minister to you? Or are they always asking you, each aunt, cousin, they only, do they only call you if they need something? Or do they call you sometimes and say, how are you doing? I was praying for you. Is there anything I can help you with today? You know what's sad? Even some grandmas and grandpas can be self-centered where they want their people, grandkids around them because of how it makes them feel, not because they really care to be involved in their grandkids' life. I'm telling you this because it's very easy for us to get into this place where family might treat you as if you don't count and your heart doesn't matter. But I'm here to remind you that there's another family that you're part of, and that family that you're part of, though they're not blood, there's a family of God, of believers. There's a family of believers that are supposed to sacrifice for each other. They're supposed to speak encouragement for, to each other. They're supposed to bless each other. They're supposed to be initiators of love towards each other. And if you're part of that family and it's sweet and it's powerful, then praise God. Say amen. Hit a thumbs up if you have that family circle. And if you don't, I am so sorry. But I invite you to join us and be part of this family so maybe we can love on you a little bit. Now, I would be remiss if I only focused on one side, right? And that side was how does your family treat you? What I also need to make sure that I focus on is how do you treat your family? Because sometimes what ends up happening is this, that you end up treating your family in a totally negative way. You treat them in a, yes, click that. You treat them in a way that actually um, is all about you. So the family says, hey, we're having this gathering for, our, for grandma, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, I'm too busy to go, right? Because you don't get anything from it, right? What I'm saying to you is you want to be careful that you aren't being self-centered in how you love your family. Because if the way you love your family is always only focused on what you get from it, what helps you, how you function, then you, I am sorry, you are totally missing what it means to have real love in a family environment. Now, I'm not here to beat you up, okay? I'm not. I'm really not. Here's what I'm going to say to you. Not all of us were raised in a family that was healthy, okay? The truth is most families um, or people who grow up and grow older, but sometimes we don't get healthier as we grow older. So I'm challenging you to break the cycle. That whether or not your family members gave you the love they should have, that you become that person. That you become that person that will always give storge love that you will always give that godly love to your family members, that you will be devoted to them whether they're devoted to you or not, that you will let their harsh words be that, something that God will handle, that you don't have to get into the mix. Because if you are a child of God, I'm just going to have to be honest with you. If you are a child of God and you refuse to love your family members, 
you are blaspheming in the name of God. To say you're a Christian, but you ignore loving on your family, simply because of hard feelings, that is not at all what Christianity is like. Because you now lost your testimony to your loved ones and to everybody they encounter. So don't become a fake Christian by being self-centered and being all about you in your family relationship. But we're going to continue because like we said, there are four different types of love, right? The other love that we have is going to be that filial love, right? That friend love. Now, fake friends. Everybody's got one, right? You've all had somebody you thought were friends for you. Turns out that they're not, right? We've all had that, where we have somebody who is friends, but they're not, right? You, you said, oh, man, they're going to have my back, and turns out they don't. And the reason behind that is really simple. The truth of the matter is, a lot of times, people are self-centered. The reason why they are actually in your life has very little to do with you. They're in your life because of what they're getting from the relationship with you. As soon as you start saying no, you start seeing you lose some friends. You start saying, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, today I can't give you a ride. You're like, oh, really? They stop calling so much. Oh, no, I can't lend you this money. Okay, really? No, I'm not going to cook for you. Oh, no, I can't go to this place. No, right? You get into a situation where you start to pull back because of situations that you need to take care of. And now all of a sudden, because you can't give them what they need, these friends, these friends start to treat you as if, if you don't give me what I need, I don't need you in my life. Did you know that the Bible actually have a definition for friendship? It's very clear, right? It says this. It says it in a really simple way. It says, as iron, right, think of iron, sharpens iron. Right? So if two irons are there, that's not friendship. Right? But as the irons start to sharpen each other, that process of sharpening each other is what the Bible calls friendship. Right? If only one person is sharpening the other, that's not called friendship. That's called ministry. And there's a lot of people in your life that God asks you to sharpen, to bless, to encourage, to walk with, to give money for, to cook for, to drive around, and you think that's my friend. That's not your friend. That is somebody God is asking you to bless, to encourage, to minister to. Some of you are getting ministered to by somebody, and it's one way, and you're like, that's my friend. Well, so let me ask that question now. How are you treating your friends? How, how self-centered, how one-sided is this relationship? Here's what I mean by that. When you guys talk, whether it's on the phone or face-to-face, -face, right? How much of the conversation that you're having that you think is so awesome includes you listening to their heart? Includes you valuing the things that are on their heart at the moment of time that they're living in. I'm not talking about you talking to somebody and reminiscing about the back in the day when we were close or when we went to high school together or when we did this together, when we did that. No, 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 no. How much of your present conversation is in tune with the heart of this person you say is a friend? You say, that's my friend. But do you, really, uh, do you really care about the things that they're going on with in their life right now? Or is it a friend that you call because they're always willing to listen to you as you pour your heart out? See, if that's the case, if, if you're always going there to pour your heart out to them, that's not 
like what John 3.16, where God gave, that's where you took, right? That's where you went there and took their time. You went there and took their advice. You went there and you took their listening ear, but you did not give them what you were taking from them. See, if your friendship with them is always about what you get from it, I'm sorry to tell you that you have fake love towards this friend. A true friend, again, is iron and iron sharpening each other. And if they are not sharpening each other, that's just one person ministering to another, and that's on the good side. There's some people, though, I challenge, I'll tell you, pay attention. Pay attention to how people respond when you stop giving them the things they wanted from you. Pay attention. I find it very, very interesting that when I stop helping people, they disappear out of my life. At first, that used to hurt my heart, right? But the, the reason it used to hurt my heart was I used to think that they were my friend. I misclassified them. When in fact, what they were was somebody God asked me to minister to that I became close with. And since I became close with them, I started putting friendship expectations on them. But the problem with that is I will never get it back. Because I was never supposed to get it back. Don't get it mixed. It. Don't get it twisted. Please, please, please. It will, you will cause so much hurt to your heart. There's only going to be a small group of friends that you will have in your entire life. Probably you can count them on one hand. Okay? The friends you will have in your entire life. And of those friends you have in your entire life, very few of them you will have for your, the entirety of your life. Most of them will come in for a season, and that's it. And that's great. Cherish that season. Look back at that season. Celebrate that season. But if your friendship is always going to be centered around you, or if the people you call friend, if their love towards you is always centered around them, I'm sorry, it's just fake friendship with fake love. We're going to continue this journey and we're going to see. If this is speaking to you, give me a thumbs up. Give me an amen. Talk to me. Share with me. Um, I'm not here again. We're not doing this because we are seeking to destroy anything or attack you. But I also don't want you to be existing in this place where you don't know, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know what real love is. And then you have these relationships that are fake, but they feel real to you, but they function fake. Now, this one tends to, tends to be a hard one for a lot of people, right? This is where that fake love, that love centered on self, is that relationship, that romantic relationship, right? Um, that Ariel's love. All right, so let me ask this question. Kind of simple, right? We're going to go back to the same thing, right? How does this person that you say you're in a relationship with, right? You could be dating. You could be hoping to date. Or you could be married with this person. How do they treat you? Think about this. We covered love languages, right? The last week's sermon covered love languages, right? Are they willing to love you in your love language? Are they really willing to do it? Or is that just like an aspirational goal where they're like, at some point, I would love to love you in your love language, but for now, I'm just going to do it in mine. I'm going to be self-centered. If my love language is time, I'm just going to give you time. Even if you want gifts, I'm going to give you time. Even if you want touch, I'm going to give you time. Even if you want acts of service, I'm going to give you time. It doesn't matter if you want words. I'm going to give you time. Why? Because time is my love language. So I'm going to give you what I want. That is a self-centered love. And it's fake. Sorry to tell you this. It's fake. But it can be real. Okay? It can. All right? So much, so many Christian men use the Bible 
use the Bible to actually promote a self-centered relationship with their wife where the wife should submit to them, surrender to them, and they ignore the part of the verse that says we have to submit to each other. We have to surrender to each other. One of the requirements of being a Christian is that you have to be surrendered to each other. So if you marry a Christian person, then you actually have to surrender to them and they have to surrender to you. It's mutual acts of surrender. The roles are different, so submission looks different to each side, but you have to surrender to each other. In fact, if you treat husbands, your wife, as a, in a way God doesn't accept, God says he will no longer hear your prayers. That's how important it is to God that you treat your spouse in the right way. So how are they treating you? Hmm? Are they loving you their way? Or are they taking time to use words that show you I care about you? Are they willing to sacrifice for you? Now, that you, you know, usually we're really quick to say what our spouse is missing. I remember a long time ago, I used to be like, when I was first married, the first two, three years of marriage, I was just ready. I was like, man, my wife needs to get this and this and this together. And then my best friend, right, I talked with him one day and I went to him and I was complaining about some stuff my wife did, you know. And I went to my best friend and I was like, yeah, man, and da, 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 da. And then he was like, she's right. And I was like, she's, she's right. Did you switch sides? Did you not know that you're my friend and you can't, you know, say stuff like she's right? And he, then he broke it down for me and what I discovered was what she was complaining about was things that I was refusing to fix within myself. And I was not liking that she was complaining about it. I would rather that she kept it quiet and act like it wasn't there because I was acting like it wasn't there. So how are you treating your spouse? We're quick to identify when they are doing something wrong. But how are you treating your, your spouse? Are you actually giving them the love that they need? Did you even take the love the five love language test. Do you even know what your spouse needs? Do you know what their love languages are? The Bible is full of examples of spouses neglecting each other. There are very poor examples of love. That's why God gave us Jesus. And he says, this is how Jesus loves the church, like a husband should love his bride. And how did he do it? By sacrificing his very life for her. Because love is always about giving to others. So I'm here to tell you that if your love is, I don't care if you, if you quote 50 Bible verses that tells your spouse how they should surrender to you. I'm here to tell you that if your love in your romantic life is centered around you, it is fake love. Your marriage is not for what you get from it. You found somebody, God gifted you somebody to love, to make it about them. And if me as a husband, if I make my relationship with my marriage, my love about how much I can love her instead of how much she doesn't love me or how much I want her to do this, then I totally perverted what marriage is. Whether she loves me or not, I am married to her because this is the person God has gifted me with to love, to, to make it about her. Now a healthy marriage will always have that other side where they're making it about you, right? And so if I was making it about her and she is making it about me, right, she is not focused on herself and what she wants and what she likes, then we are both being selfless and both of our needs get met because we're meeting each other's needs and we're placing each other's needs before our personal wants. This is what is causing divorce to just skyrocket in Christian churches everywhere. It's because people are talking about the love they're not feeling because they are making it about them. And then you always have in a divorce, 
you always have at least one person who is so wrapped up in their own feeling that they won't sacrifice for the other. And the problem is the other spouse starts to double sacrifice to try to make up for it, and that will never work. I can never sacrifice and enough for my spouse for us to have a healthy marriage. I can only sacrifice as a husband, and I give what a husband can give, and she gives what a wife can give, and then together our marriage is healthy. Does that make sense? We're going to continue on here. Because there's one more aspect of this that you need to get. Because real love, real love is always other-centered. Again, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world. If we are children of love, if we are his children, that's what we are. If we're his children, we are by default children of love. And we are called to give to the world. So, I have to ask the question, how is your church treating you? How is your church treating you? So, I mean, I heard this quote that says, there's no hurt like church hurt. Got it. There was a moment of hurt, but how are they treating you now? How is your present church? So let me define church for you from a biblical standpoint. Church is not the denomination you belong to, right? Some of you might be Seventh-day Adventist, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Pentecostal, non-denominational, right? You can be all sorts of denominations. That's not church. Biblical church is always a community of believers that are living life together. So how is the community of believers that are living life with you, how are they treating you? Those people who say, I got you, I am in this journey with you, are they being self-centered in everything? Are they always asking of you but not giving to you? Are they always seeking for you to just be a constant giver but they themselves are not giving unto you? You see, they're supposed to be selfless so that they can minister to you what you need. And I'm going to tell you this. I grew up, man, and I grew up like just not like in church. That traditional church stuff, I grew up not liking it at all. I, so for, if you're that person who just don't like church, I get you. But the problem was I didn't understand what biblical church was. So what I was saying that I didn't like wasn't the reality what the Bible said what church really is. And so I went to church and I saw these judgmental people in the building. The songs were boring. It wasn't my style, right? And, 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 and if you're a worship leader, you know this, right? If you sing a song and you get all excited and you're jumping up and down, somebody's going to sit in the church and be like, what's wrong with that person? You know, this is the holy temple. Why are you desecrating the temple? Be solemn and peaceful and meditate, right? But then if you go all solemn and, and, and meditation, right, the other people are going to come in and be like, this is a dead church. Wow, you should be jumping up and shouting. You're never going to please everybody if you chase their preferences. And church is full of people. And every person has a preference for what they like and what they don't like. But church is not about your preferences. I don't care if you've been in the church for 20 years. I don't care if you built the physical building. You will never have built the church. Christ built the church. The church is his people who live in community and they go and do his, the Father's will. So I need to also ask that question. How are you actually, how are you treating the church? Are you available? Like, I, I've seen so often that people actually would come and say, hey, there's some needs 
and the church is trying to meet the needs. The community of believers is trying to meet the needs. But we need your help. Will you come help us? And then you start giving all these self-centered reasons why you're too busy or you're not ready or you're uncomfortable. I'm sorry. You cannot be gifted with the ability to sing and never sing for God's glory. You can't be gifted with the ability to teach and never teach the word of God. You can't be gifted with the gift of administration and never help organize the church body. You can't be gifted with money and never give any of it to further the kingdom of God. You cannot live in a self-centered way if you're part of a church family because the church family needs you to love them and love is always other focus. You might not like the church denomination. You might not like the pastor or the singers, the music or the hymns. You might not like certain people in a church. But God says the church is my bride. God says the church is my bride. I dare you to go to a man who just proposed to a woman and they're about to get married and you now to his face insult the woman he just proposed to. I dare you to go tell that person uh, in front of that man who just said, I give my life to you. Will you surrender to me? Will you love me back? I'm surrendering to you. Can we live together forever? You are my world. And she says, yes, I'll marry you. He gets off his knees. And now you go up there and you tell that woman about all the things you don't like about her while the fiance is standing there. I challenge you to do that. Because... You're going to get physically hurt that day. I'm going to tell you right now. That man might be a bishop or a pastor or a priest, but in the face of you insulting his bride, I, I'm just telling you, it's just not a smart move. And that's the indifference we show God when we insult his church. When we, when we attack it so casually as if he's not in love with his church. See, God's not in love with denominations. How do I know that? There is nothing in the Bible that references a single denomination. But God's in love with his church. If the, the community of people who believe in Christ, that he died for their sins and that he's Lord of their life and they're committed their entire life to going to share the gospel with the world, that's his church. You can be a drug addict. You, can be, you could have killed somebody like Moses. You could have slept with somebody's wife like David. You could have stoned and betrayed the, the people in the congregation like Paul. It doesn't matter to God. When you give your life to him, you become that beloved in his eyes. You become his church. Be careful how you treat the bride of God because he pays attention. Let's go back through these four love languages. These four, not sorry, the four types of loves again. I need you to understand when you look at this, right? We got that store gay love, that family members. How are you loving your family? Does it reflect that God is in your heart? How are you loving your friends? Does it reflect that God is in your heart? How are you loving that person you're romantically involved with? Does it show that you are not self-centered? Because if you love all of these people in a self-centered way, your love is fake. It's not real. I know we want real love, but if you want real love, you need to get into the habit of giving real love. I want to pray for you because you might be struggling, right? You might have family that's so broken, you don't know how to love them. You might have friends who betrayed you and you don't know how to move forward. And you might have gotten a divorce from the person who you gave your life and your heart to. That's why agape love is so important. You see, agape love is that healing love from God that covers it all. Agape love can restore you so that you can love 
your family the right way, so you can love your friends the right way, and so you can be open again to love romantically. But if you don't allow that agape love in, it can't transform all the relationships you have. So let me pray for you right now. Join me, will you, as we pray together. Heavenly Father, I lift up every single person that's listening right now as I pray. Father, I ask that you just heal the family wounds that we carry. Father, our families have been broken for a long time, but God, you are the healer. You are the fixer. We can't do it in our strength. We can't restore, God. So we are asking for your agape love to flow so strongly through us that it can restore our family relationships. Family, this is a hard time, God, for us to have real friendships. Facebook says everybody we know is a friend, God, but you've taught us that friendship is rarer than that. Father, and I pray for you to restore friendships. And for those who've never had a true friend, God, I pray that you send them someone that will be that iron that can sharpen them. And they'll have that mutual sharpening experience that is such a blessing. Father, I pray, Lord, for those in romantic relationships and those seeking romantic relationships, that you will heal them so they don't bring all the brokenness of their family and their friendships into their marriage or to their dating relationship, God. Father, for those of us who've been hurt by church people, I pray that you show us that they were just broken people, that they, that was not you, God, so that we can love you with a clean heart. I pray this, God, because it's your will that we be restored at a heart level. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I thank you for joining us. Um, right now, we, we have been, we've reached over 80,000 people worldwide. And I just want to say thank you for being a part of this journey with us and for helping us reach all of these people. We're going to continue to share the gospel, and the way we're going to do that is through these Facebook Live sermons. So I'm going to ask you to like it and share it. You heard me right. Like it and share it with somebody so they too can be blessed. Have a phenomenal day. God bless you.